All right, good morning and welcome to our weekly Bible prophecy update. We're so glad that you're joining with us. We know that we have a lot of new people and for the benefit of those who are new, we would like to encourage you to also join with us at 11.15 a.m. Hawaii time for our second service. So first service is the prophecy update, and then second service is actually the expositional teaching, the Sunday morning sermon. And we're currently in a verse-by-verse study through 1 Timothy, and we'd certainly encourage you to join with us for that as well. Today, I'll be talking about why it is, and it really, again, is one of those days where the teaching ties into the prophecy update. And I'm going to talk about how and why, really, we can trust in the Lord to get us through this global crisis that we're in and facing today. Very encouraged and really looking forward to what the Lord has for us. So really encourage you to join with us. Also, I wanted to thank everyone that reached out to me after the explosion in my birthplace of Beirut, Lebanon. I do not know if I have any family currently in uh, Beirut, but we certainly need to pray for the people of Beirut. I don't know if you've been following this, even before I left to come to church this morning. um, The rioting and the protests are growing in numbers. You have to understand that particularly in Beirut, but really all over the world, uh, the world is on the brink, which we talked about last week, on the brink of a complete and total collapse, governmentally, economically, all of the above. And certainly this is the case in Lebanon, in Israel too. I don't know if you've been following what's happening in Israel as well. Um, As for those asking about the prophetic significance of this, there's still so much that we don't know, but it sure does seem to bring Isaiah 17, 1 into focus. This is a prophecy about the destruction of Damascus, uh, bringing this city to a ruinous heap, so much so that it's uninhabitable. We've talked in previous updates at length about this prophecy and the many others like it. And so maybe yet future, Lord willing, we may uh, revisit those prophecies as well. But for today, we're going to do something different, as I mentioned last week, and talk about the pre-tribulation rapture. Namely, proof from Scripture that the rapture of the church absolutely has to happen before the seven year tribulation. At the end of this live stream, we're going to have a link for those of you online and those of you locally, if you're interested, we've got a PDF file. It's a four page PDF file that we're going to have on our website and we'll put the link at the conclusion of the live stream that you can go to our website and download. It's going to have everything, actually more than what we're going to uh, look at today, but all the notes and references and scriptures and so forth. So if you're interested in those, you can uh, go to that link, which will be available at the conclusion of the video. All right, before we jump into this, I want to address the question of why this and why now? I have two main reasons. The first of which is because of the swiftness with which everything that we're told will happen during the seven year tribulation is beginning to happen now. Very fast, swiftly, I mean breakneck speed. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 21, verse 18, Jesus said, when you see these things begin, keyword, to come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, because your redemption draws nigh. So in other words, when you start seeing these prophecies beginning to 
come to pass. Prophecies that we know from Scripture will ultimately find their fulfillment in and during the seven year tribulation. And they're already starting to happen now. I like the the best illustration I ever heard was that of Christmas and Thanksgiving. You know how during that time of the year you go into the malls? Well, now you can't. I don't know. Can you? I don't know. I don't get out much, but (laughs) let's just say you can wear your mask. And um, you go in and all of the decorations and the signs are up for Christmas. And it's earlier and earlier every year. Have you noticed this? So like September, you already have Christmas, you know, stuff up. It's only September. So uh, here's the thing. You go in and you see all of the signs up for Christmas, but Thanksgiving is before Christmas. So if Christmas is that close, how much closer is Thanksgiving? You get the point? When you see the the signs of all of these prophecies in the tribulation already up and running, so to speak, and the rapture like Thanksgiving is before Christmas like the second coming, how close are we? That's why we're talking about this now. The second reason really ties into the first and It's that if we as Christians are unsettled concerning the pre-trib rapture, let me back up, the sound doctrine of the pre-trib rapture, then we in effect give Satan a blank check to fill in the amount of doubt and fear in our lives. Because if I'm not sure, I'm uncertain, I'm not really convinced, I don't really believe, then that's a game changer. That changes everything. Now I'm not looking for Jesus Christ. I'm looking for the Antichrist. I'm facing a very serious life and death for all eternity decision about whether or not I'm going to accept the mark of the beast, which is already in play and the technology already in play, and the Antichrist system already in play. It's already here. It's just a matter of time. And there's this, we've talked about this before, and I don't want to uh, spend too much time on it, but I think it's maybe apropos and germane to our understanding. Bible prophecy has what I like to refer to as a shelf life and expiration date. You know, when you have things in motion and you have this momentum, there's no pushing the pause button. It's that proverbial, when the iron is hot, strike. Strike when the iron's hot. Or as we've heard it said more times than we care to remember or mention, never let a good crisis go to waste. I would venture to say this is not a good crisis. This is a near perfect crisis. I mean, if you wanted to come up with the perfect crisis, this would be it. I have to confess that just going back through my archives to prepare for today's teaching has really greatly encouraged me, uh, renewed my hope and reinforced my faith. Not that I had any doubts, I just needed to go back into Scripture, back into the Word of God, back to the God of the Word, and revisit this life-changing truth to reinforce. Because I have to confess, I mean, I'm looking at all that's happening, and I'm like, it better be a pre-tribulation rapture, right? And it is. And it's my hope and my prayer that you will be greatly encouraged today and renewed in your hope and strengthened in your heart. So what follows are seven of the many reasons proving a pre-tribulation rapture. And I put it in the form of an acrostic of the word rapture the revelation to us, the effect upon us, 
the purity of us, the trumpets for us, the uniformity with us, the responsibility on us, and the encouragement from us. How clever is that? (laughs) I came up with this 11 years ago. Give me a break. (laughs) I kind of like it. Hope you do too. It's an easy way to remember. In fact, I used the first letter in an acrostic form to memorize all of the books of the Bible, just taking the first letter of the name of each book. And I was able uh, to memorize the names of the books of the Bible, both Old and New Testament doing that. So, and actually in the Psalms, for those of you that were with us during our, our study through the Psalms, many of the Psalms were written in acrostic form for the sake of memory. That's how you memorize by way of an across. Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. So there you have it. All right, let's start with the first reason. The revelation to us from the book of Revelation. The only book in all of the Bible that promises a blessing to those who read it, hear it, and take it to heart. No other book in the entire Bible has a blessing like that in the book of Revelation. And yet, sadly, it is the one book of the Bible that Christians avoid like the plague. And in so doing, they are robbed of the blessing that awaits, and they're afraid of it. You know, it's so apocalyptic, which is actually what the word revelation in the original Greek comes from, apocalypsos where we get our English word apocalypse. And so when you hear that word, what, what do you, you know, imagine or picture in your mind's eye? Apocalypse, oh no! You know what actually it really means? It's an unveiling, a revealing. I know this is deeply profound. Revelation, revelation. It's an unveiling, a revealing of future events. That's what the book of Revelation is. In verse 19 of chapter 1, one has referred to this as the divine outline in the book of Revelation. John is told by Jesus to write the things which you have seen and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. Metatauta in the Greek, after these things. In other words, John, write that which you were an eyewitness of past, write that which is now present, and write that which is yet future. Past, present, and future. And so the whole book of Revelation can be divided by way of this divine outline, past, present, and future. Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, and all the way through to the end of the book, is yet future. So John writes, verse 1, Revelation 4, after this, this is future now, I looked, and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. So John is, if you will, raptured up, caught up, taken up to heaven, And then Jesus says, come up here, and I'm going to show you now what's going to happen. How cool is that? So here's the thing. You have now in this divine outline, past, present, and future, proof of a pre-tribulation rapture. And I'll tell you how I get there. Chapter 1 is past. All chapter 1 is about is Jesus Christ crucified, buried, resurrected, and glorified. Past tense that which you have seen. John was an eyewitness of it. Chapters 2 and 3, present. Church history, seven letters to seven physical churches in modern day Turkey, known then as Asia Minor, written by John, inspired 
by Jesus and sent to these seven churches in that region at that time. That's church history. And here's the thing. The word church is mentioned 19 times in chapters 1, 2, and 3. Do you know how many times it's mentioned after chapter 4, verse 1? Zero. See, chapters 4 and 5, really the rapture, chapters 6 through 19, all about the seven-year tribulation, chapter 20, the millennium, chapters 21 and 22, the new heavens and the new earth. That is a beautiful, magnificent, divine outline in the book of Revelation. Now, why isn't the church mentioned in chapters 6 through 19 all about the tribulation? Because the church is not in the tribulation. I mean, I, call me silly, I've been called worse, <laughs> but doesn't that make sense? Well, then one might ask, well, yeah, but what about those that uh, are, are, are saved in the tribulation? They're not the bride. We're going to talk more about that in a moment. They're affectionately referred to as tribulation saints. These are those who will reject the mark of the beast and the Antichrist. They will accept Jesus Christ and they will die for their faith and they will be martyred. And even as we've talked about before in prior updates, beheaded. Those are not the bride, they are saved Christians. Uh, when you get into Revelation, they are serving at the throne, but the bride is seated with Christ on the throne. Make that delineation, that distinction between the two. They're not the bride. They're not going to be complaining, believe me, <laughs> but they're just not the bride, the bride of Christ. All right, the second reason. The rapture has to happen before the seven-year tribulation because of the effect upon us. Let me explain. Knowing that the rapture can happen at any moment, should and even will have a profound effect on how we live our lives in this world. This is what's known as the doctrine of imminence. I love that word imminent, because it's kind of one of those words that sounds like what it is. Any minute. Imminent. I know that's not the literal definition, just, you know, indulge me. But it's this, this, uh, the doctrine of imminence is this sound doctrine that nothing has to happen before the rapture happens that the rapture can happen at any time. It is imminent. It can happen at any minute. Okay, that's the last time I'll do that. So, <laughs> And because of that, it should have such an impact on how we live our lives. Matthew 24, to me, one of the most powerful and profound parables the Savior ever taught. Beginning in verse 45, Jesus speaking, Jesus teaching says, Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns, truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But, verse 48, by way of contrast, suppose that servant is wicked. And he says to himself, come on, my master is staying away a long time. He delays he's coming. He's not coming back. They've been saying he's coming back for generations. And what's the impact? What's the effect? Verse 49. Well, he then begins to beat his fellow servants 
and to eat and drink with drunkards. And then we're told, verse 50, the master of that servant, interesting detail, will come on a day when he does not expect him, and at an hour he is not aware of, he will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You know what the greatest lie is? The greatest lie from the pit of hell is not, there is no God, or even that there is no heaven, not even that there is no hell. Those are all lies, but the greatest lie is not, there's no heaven or there's no hell. The greatest lie is, there's no hurry. There's no urgency. We still got plenty of time. Party on! (laughs) Not the righteous servant. Not the good and faithful servant. Well done. Why? Because he lived with that expectancy, the anticipation of the imminent return of his master who could come at any time. And so he lived his life always ready, always watching, which is the exhortation throughout Scripture is to be ready, be watching, so that when He comes, it will not be for you as a thief in the night. We just got done studying about this in our study through First and Second Thessalonians. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 8. I love this promise. This is a go-to, man. Paul's at the end of his life now, and we're going to get there. If the rapture doesn't happen first, because we're in First Timothy, and what comes after First Timothy is Again, I know deeply profound, Second Timothy. And so when we get to chapter 4, verse 8, we'll talk about this more. But Paul's at the end of his life, and he knows it. And he says, verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness. I've run the race. I've, I've fought the fight. <laughs> and now what awaits me, what's in store for me, is this crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, get this, but also to all who have longed for His appearing. Oh my goodness. You know what this means? I know guys get weird on this. You know, it's kind of like crowns are for girls. Trust me, you're going to want these crowns. And this is one of them. And it's the crown of righteousness that awaits those of us who are watching, longing, aching, begging, waiting, wanting the Lord to return. First John chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Dear friends, now We are children of God, and what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when Christ appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And then he says this, verse 3, listen very carefully. All who have this hope in Him purify themselves just as He is pure. Let me first say what John is not saying here. He's not saying that we have this propensity or potential in and of ourselves to cleanse ourselves or purify ourselves. No. This is John saying, listen, um, you're the bride of Christ. And the bride, we're going to talk about this in a moment, uh, is a pure virgin bride. And you're made pure by way of Christ's imputed righteousness. And what John is saying is, if you're really longing for His appearing, you're going to get your affairs in order. You're going to get serious about the things of God. You're going to get right with God, and you're going to be ready for the Lord's return. Well, this brings us to our third reason really ties into it, and it's the purity of us as the bride of Christ. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 2 and 3, Paul says, I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. And here's why. He says, I promised you, betrothed you to one husband. You're engaged to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. What Paul is describing here, and he echoes it in his other letters, is that we are the bride of Christ, engaged to Christ, soon to be married at the marriage to Christ. We're going to be his husband. And again, I know guys get really weird on this, but uh, trust me, (laughs) you want to be the bride. You want to be the bride. To me, One of the most convincing and compelling proofs of the pre-tribulation rapture is that of the ancient Jewish wedding customs, which paints this magnificent picture of a pre-tribulation rapture. It also answers the often asked question of whether or not Jesus ever taught a pre-tribulation rapture. And thankfully, not only did Jesus teach this, the Gospels are replete with Jesus speaking as a bridegroom to His bride, and they would have known it. They would have understood it. Many of you know that I was asked to be a part of Before the Wrath by Brent Miller Jr., the executive producer of Ingenuity Films, and it was such a privilege because the film is all about this typology. And it's available on Amazon Prime. I would encourage you to watch it if you haven't already. It's a very well done film specifically about the typology in the Galilean wedding. So what follows is a brief explanation. Now the notes will have more, but in the interest of time, I want to Uh, show you specifically the typology as to why it is that the rapture of the bride of Christ absolutely has to happen before the seven number of completion year tribulation. Let's start with the first one. In the Jewish wedding, there's a marriage covenant, ketubah, and it's made in writing for the bride as a promise to the bride, that it will be fulfilled. You know, it's that, it's that promise ring when you're engaged. This is a promise, a covenant. With our wedding, a new covenant is made in the written Word of God for us as the bride, and the old covenant promise is fulfilled. Now you'll notice that there are scripture references there on the screen. Again, the notes will have those and even more as well the Jewish wedding. They would then, once this covenant was made, they would break bread and drink from the cup to seal the betrothal, kiddushin, of this new covenant. With our wedding, he breaks bread and drinks from the cup at the last supper with the disciples, sealing his new covenant in his blood. That was all about the bridegroom with the bride and the promise of this wedding that was coming. That's what the whole Last Supper was about. In the Jewish wedding, the groom pays the price, mohar, showing the bride his love for her. With our wedding, Jesus paid the price on the cross in full. And this shows us, the bride, how there's no greater love than His laying down of His life for us. In the Jewish wedding, the groom prepares a place for his bride. So after the engagement, 
They break bread. They drink from the cup. They seal the betrothal. And the groom says to his bride, soon to be wife, I'm going to go now and I'm going to prepare a place, a bridal chamber, a room addition on my father's house so we can consummate and celebrate the marriage. And when it's done, I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. I'm going to take you and we're going to get married. That was the custom. With our wedding, this is what Jesus said. He said, behold, I go to prepare a place for you. In my Father's house are many mansions, some translations render it, dwelling places. And where I go, I'm going to come back. If it were not so, I would not have told you. I'm going to come back for you. He's speaking as a groom to his bride. I'm going to go build our bridal chamber. I'm going to come back and get you. In the Jewish wedding, the father is the only one who knows the day or hour of the groom's return for his bride. And with our wedding, Jesus said that no one but the father knows the day or the hour of his return for us as his bride. In the Jewish wedding, when the bridegroom does come, the groomsmen run ahead and shout, he's coming, and they blow the trumpet. He's coming, he's coming. With our wedding, when our bridegroom comes, it will be with a shout of the trumpet of God that Jesus is coming for us as His bride. Now this is where it gets really interesting. And I did not know this before uh, I did the Before the Wrath documentary. And this is uh, part of what they found, the archaeological digs there in the Galilee region. And when Brent told me about this, I was like, oh my goodness, I got I to gotta go back and redo all of the teachings over the years on the Jewish wedding, because I did not know this. This is amazing. This is chicken skin. So the groom comes, takes his bride. The bride is placed in this chair and lifted up off the earth and carried in the air to her groom. Just like when Jesus comes, our bridegroom, we're going to be lifted up in the air and taken to Him to meet Him in the air. Wow. Now, in the Jewish wedding, and this is where we see can I say it like this? Forensic evidence, proof of a pre-tribulation rapture. Because the groom takes his bride to the chamber and they consummate Nisuin and celebrate for a period of Shavua. Seven. Not three and a half. I'm sorry. I told the Lord I wouldn't do that. I just did it. No, just bear with me, okay? Just, okay, just seven is the number of completion. It is Daniel's 70th week. Last time I checked, there are seven days in a week. It is a period, if if you put the bride of Jesus Christ anywhere into the tribulation, the seven-year tribulation, you dismantle, even destroy the typology. And God takes that very seriously. Ask Moses about that. What do you mean? Oh, don't you remember what happened? So Moses was commanded, the Israelites are complaining we're, we're, we're going to die. Were, were there not enough graves in Egypt to kill us and bury us there? God had to lead us out here in the wilderness and kill us. We're, we, we don't, we're dying of thirst. Where's the water? So God's like, hey, Moses, strike the rock and water's going to come out. And so he did. Now it happens again. <laughs> and again, they complain and murmur and and Moses has had it. 
And God says, I want you not strike the rock, speak to the rock. But what does Moses do in his outrage and anger? He actually, it's quite interesting, the detail. I didn't mean to go too far into this, but maybe uh, the, you need to hear this when it comes to the typology of seven. Uh, he says, how long are we going to have to put up with you? I could just picture, I know a son in the text, I could just picture God going, yo, Mo, come here. <laughs> What's this we stuff? <laughs> oh, you're on the same level with me now. It cost him the promised land. You know that, right? Why? Because he destroyed the typology. What typology? That rock is Christ. And Jesus was only struck once, crucified once, not twice. After the crucifixion, now you can speak to Christ. That's what the typology was. You can now speak to the rock, but what does he do? He strikes it a second time, ruins the typology. God takes that very seriously. Maybe this is as good of a time as any, and I didn't actually plan to say this, but maybe I do need to say this. In love, without exception, whenever I talk about the pre-tribulation rapture, I am, oh my goodness, I am just excoriated. And some of the vile and foul comments that are made and Man, I get emails from people, and they are basically calling me every name in the book, accusing me of being a false teacher, leading people astray. And I just want to say to you, you might want to think twice before posting a comment or sending an email like that. And I'll tell you why. You're going to have to give an account for every letter of every word that you post. And I say that as one who has to guard my own heart. And you better be very careful because you'll be judged according to every word you write and type and post and send. All right. I'm still going to get it, but that's all right. (laughs) So Jesus is going to come and take us to this place that he's prepared for us. And we are going to celebrate for a period of seven years. I like how one said it, while the world is tribulating, we're going to be celebrating and consummating our marriage to the Lamb. In the Jewish wedding, this is after the seven years, seven days. There's this huge feast. You know what this means, right? This should be of great encouragement especially to the guys, food in heaven. You know, for the women too, you know, it's no cholesterol, no calories, no fat, no nothing. It's the wedding feast of the Lamb. And it's after the seven day year celebration. And we too, after the seven year celebration and consummation, we emerge from the bridal chamber. And there's this huge marriage feast of the Lamb that we celebrate. This is why post-tribulation is always uh, a hard one, because if the rapture, hypothetically, just for purpose of discussion, was post-tribulation, the wedding feast is going to be a drive through sack lunch on a bungee cord, because you're, you're, and there's no seven years. And, and there's the typology again. Well, last one. In the Jewish wedding, the new home of the bride was Jerusalem, and it was the bridegroom who came to the bride to dwell with her. And it's from the new Jerusalem that Jesus, our bridegroom, will dwell with us forever and ever in the new Jerusalem for all eternity. This brings us to the fourth reason, which is that of the trumpets for us. 
Trumpets in Scripture are sounded to bring God's people up to meet Him or assemble together for a wedding. Trumpets are also sounded for another reason, which is that of assembling God's people for a battle in war. In both the Old and New Testament, there are two trumpets for two distinct purposes. There's also the first trumpet and the last trumpet. Stay with me on this. This is very important. And this is where a lot of Christians get into a lot of trouble when they interpret Scripture, specifically Bible prophecy. The first trumpet is for Israel. The last trumpet is for the church. The first trumpet in the Old Testament for Israel is in the book of Exodus, chapter 19, verses 16 and 17. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning, interesting, there's a a type, did you catch that? That there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet with God, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. This was the trumpet, the first trumpet, to assemble God's people to meet Him. The last trumpet is for us, the church. And we see this in Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, where he describes the rapture of the church. It's chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. He says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, speaking of death, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet key. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Now, before we go any further, I think I'd be grossly remiss were I not to address the trumpet that's in the book of Revelation, chapter 10, verse 7. It says, but in the days when the seventh angel is about to sound his trumpet, the mystery of God will be accomplished just as he announced to his servants, the prophets. Now, many suggest that this is during the tribulation, and this is the last trumpet, and that's why the rapture can't happen until this trumpet in the tribulation. Here's the problem, and here's why that's not true. It's a trumpet that is sounded by an angel. This is not the last trumpet. You have to understand, this is so important. Please don't miss this. There are two trumpets in Scripture, one of which is the trumpet of angels, and the other the trumpet of God. The trumpet of angels is for Israel, and the trumpet of God is for the church. And that's why this trumpet in Revelation during the tribulation cannot be for the church. It is the trumpet of an angel. In Matthew 24, verse 31, it says, And he will send his angels with a loud angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect Israel from the four winds, from one end of the heavens to the other. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. We're going to uh, be talking about this in a moment. For the Lord Himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God. Not a trumpet of angel, it's the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. All right, we need to keep moving. Uh, Fifth reason, the uniformity with us. Here again, we see pre-tribulation rapture typology, this time in the Old Testament. And it shows us how these types fit in the sense that they form a unity with us and a prophetic picture for us establishing this uniformity. It's uniform. We're going to start with the first two that the Savior Himself referred to in Luke's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 26 and 30. 
He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so will it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. All right. Here are just a few of the similarities in this typology in Noah's day as compared with our day, and the same with Lot's day as compared with our day. And again, the notes are going to have more uh, of these, but uh, just in the interest of time, I'll cover a few of them. First, some scholars estimate that the population of the earth in Noah's day was approximately seven to nine billion with a B people. And it's estimated today that the population of the earth has reached approximately eight billion, and very soon will reach nine billion people. There was very demonic and very sexually aberrant behavior as the norm of the day. Uh, You've uh, heard this referenced as it is in Genesis 6 uh, to the Nephilim. Uh, These were demons. And by the way, I probably should parenthetically say that there's a renewed interest. In fact, you've probably been hearing on the news a lot about these UFOs and aliens, which some believe will uh, be the explanation that they give for the disappearance of millions of people when the rapture happens. I want to be very clear when I say this and go on record and say that these UFOs, these aliens, they are demons. And in Noah's day, it was all about perverting the bloodline which is why they tried to have these sexual relations with the Israeli women, the the Israelite women, to mar and pervert and ruin the bloodline from where the Savior would come. I know it's, it's kind of intense. And I don't want to get into it, nor does time permit me to, but what is happening today, it's unspeakable what's happening today. It's unspeakable the sexual aberrance, the demonic activity. In Noah's day, man's wickedness had become so vast, and the inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And today, man's wickedness is so vast and so evil, and it continues to wax more and more evil, seemingly by the day. Again, scriptural references there, also in the notes. Noah preached while he prepared the ark, and people were warned, but no one would listen. Today, Jesus has preached, and people are being warned, but sadly, no one seems to be listening. In Noah's day, they knew nothing about what was going to happen until on that day, a flood destroyed the earth. Today, people know nothing about what's going to happen. But there is coming a day when fire will destroy the earth. However, people, as Peter tells us in his second epistle, only continue to mock and ridicule. Before the destruction of the flood in Noah's day, Enoch, who walked with God, was no more because God took him. I love that verse. I mean, he's just out, you know, just like any other day. And then poof, he's gone. Where did he go? Well, God took him. What, what a, how did God take him? God raptured him. Just caught him up in the air. Boom, he's gone. <laughs> You're looking at me like, okay, Enoch is a picture of the church. Pre-flood. Noah is a picture of Israel. Israel goes into the seven-year tribulation. But we're not a type of Noah. We're a type of Enoch. And it's pre-flood, just like we are going to be 
Is this going to be a day? Like, oh, wow, man, what, how, how about right now? <laughs> you're just going about your, your, your daily business, and then poof, that's it. You're gone. Got raptured, taken out. Before the seven-year tribulation, the way Enoch was taken out before the flood. Noah and his family, this is an interesting detail in Genesis 7, entered the ark and after seven days, the water of the flood came upon the whole earth. So too will the tribulation come upon the whole earth after were removed like Enoch and Israel will enter into the seven year tribulation and they will be saved in the midst of the seven-year tribulation, as Noah and his family, a type of Israel, was saved in the midst of the flood. And then after the judgment, they enter the new earth, just like the Jews will be saved in the tribulation. And after the judgment, will enter into the new heaven and the new earth. Let's talk about Lot real quick. Um, This is interesting. Stay with me. Lot was taken very suddenly out of Sodom before the destruction came. In fact, if you read the the text, there's some interesting detail there. Uh, You you get the impression that Lot didn't want to leave. We know his wife didn't want, we know about what happened with that. But so much so that they had to grab him by the hand, almost by force against his will, and get him out before any fire or brimstone could come down and destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot is a picture of the church. Now this answers a question regarding a false teaching known as the partial rapture theory. Let me explain just real quick. Stay with me. The partial rapture theory is only those who are really on fire for the Lord, those who are really watching for the Lord, those who are really walking close to the Lord, only they will be raptured. Uh, I think you'd be hard pressed to describe Lot like that. Uh, Lot would be, I think, the poster child for a very worldly Christian, if you will. And he was still taken out before the destruction came down. So to all our brothers and sisters who uh, hate my guts because of this teaching on the pre-trib rapture, uh, I just want you to know, if I was God, you wouldn't. I'm just going to be very honest with you. <laughs> you know, I would just say, hey, you, wanna, you want it to be mid? Aloha. Uh, I did not say Allah, by the way. Aloha. Ah. Goodness gracious. Whether you like it or not, can I say it like that? (laughs) Whether you like it or not, you're going to go up in the rapture, whether you believe it's pre-trib or not, because you're saved by grace, not works. And if you have to be walking close with the Lord in order to go up in the rapture, well, then all of a sudden you take salvation out of the arena of grace and you put it right smack in the middle of the arena of works. And that doesn't work. No pun intended. It's a play on words. This brings us to Joseph. Joseph is one of the most intriguing types of Christ in Scripture. I actually have over 100 Scripture references showing Joseph as a type of Christ. I think that's on our website as well if you wanted to download that PDF file. I want to just focus in on the typology pointing to Israel's salvation in the tribulation and a delivering of Israel in the midst of the tribulation. Just as Joseph saved Israel in the midst of the seven year famine, so too does Jesus, the greater than Joseph, save Israel in the midst of the seven year tribulation. Now, this not only points to the seven year tribulation, 
being for the salvation of the Jewish nation, it also points to a pre-tribulation rapture of the bride of Christ. And I'll explain how I get there. Just as Joseph took a Gentile bride after being exalted, so too did Jesus take a Gentile bride after being resurrected. After Joseph took his Gentile bride, his brethren entered into the seven year famine. So too, after Jesus takes us as his bride, his Jewish brethren will enter into the seven year tribulation. Genesis 41 50. Here's your scripture reference. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Patipharah, priest of On, bore to him. Why is that detail there? Because she is a type of the church pre-famine, Enoch pre-flood, the, the, the bride of Joseph pre-famine, seven year famine, a picture of the rapture of the church. After Israel's salvation in the seven year famine vis-a-vis Joseph, Israel is then delivered out of Egypt, a type of the world vis-a-vis Moses, also a type of Christ, a deliverer. Incidentally, Moses too had a Gentile bride after his rejection by his brethren and before they entered into great tribulation under Pharaoh and all of the plagues. So too Jesus, our greater than Moses, took us, his Gentile bride, after his rejection by his brethren, just as he too will take us as his bride before his brethren enter into the seven year tribulation. Isaac, also a type of Christ, who also took a Gentile bride by the name of Rebekah, who didn't go through the coming tribulation that was to come upon them. And the reason we know that is that she was taken from her home to go to Isaac before any tribulation came upon them. She's not heard of again after that. Daniel, we've talked about this before a type of the church, and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, a type of Israel, thrown into the, there's that number again. What a coincidence. Seven. Seven times hotter furnace. A picture of Israel. And they're saved in the midst of the furnace, the way that Israel will be saved in the midst of the tribulation. At the midpoint, quite literally, actually, right smack in the middle. They're a type of Israel. Where's Daniel? He's not there. Why not? Oh, so glad you asked. Because prior, pre-furnace, pre-famine, pre-flood, they all start with an F, just mention that. Pre-furnace, Daniel is exalted, taken up to a high position. Pre-furnace, and is not there. He's a picture of the church. He's taken up pre-furnace, pre, not three, isn't it interesting? It doesn't say the furnace was turned up three and a half times hotter. I'm not trying to be cute. I couldn't even if I tried, right? No, seven. The famine in Egypt, not three and a half years, seven. Seven. Okay, I feel better now. Oh, one one interesting side note. Daniel 3, they refused to worship the, this is why they ended up in the furnace, seven times hotter fiery furnace. Uh, They refused to worship the image that was 60 cubits by six cubits as six instruments played, 666, the image. And that's why they were thrown into the furnace. (laughs) We're almost done. Some of you are like, hey, did you see what time it is? Don't look at your watches. I did. (laughs) 
Ruth, the Gentile bride of Boaz, the kinsman redeemer, who clearly is a picture of Jesus Christ as our kinsman redeemer. We uh, study through the book of Ruth. It's actually available on our YouTube and uh, channel and website. What a fascinating study. One of my favorite books. I know I said about all the books, but what a fascinating book. I took my daughter through the book of Ruth. I mean, it is so amazing. Anyway, woven into the fabric of this typology is another picture of the pre-tribulation rapture. And it's even more specific as it relates to the bride of Christ and the restoration of Israel as the elect of God. I'm going to go fast. I need to stay with me. Buckle your seatbelts. Ruth 1, 19. We're told that the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. Naomi and Ruth are a type of both the Jew and the Gentile coming together because of Bethlehem. In Ruth 4.13, we're told that Boaz takes his bride and she bore a son. So too does Jesus, our greater than Boaz, take his bride as the son. And it gets really interesting here. In chapter 4, verses 16 and 17, we're told that Naomi takes the son from Ruth, who by the way is named Abed, who was the father of Jesse, who was the father of David, from whom the Savior of the world would come. This child, born in Bethlehem, is now embraced in the bosom of Naomi, a type of Israel, after taking him from Ruth, a type of the bride of Christ, and she isn't seen again in the Scriptures. So too will Israel embrace the son of David, born in Bethlehem, after taking him from the Gentile bride of Christ. Don't you get it? When the church is raptured and taken out of the way, now God shifts all of His attention to His final prophetic plan for His people Israel. That's what the tribulation is all about, because they they rejected their true Messiah. And that's what the purpose of the tribulation is for, the responsibility on us. Number six, Merriam-Webster defines responsibility as reliability and trustworthiness and something for which one is responsible in the sense that they have not abdicated or neglected their responsibilities. This is Revelation chapter 3, verses 7 through 13. The letter that is written by John from Jesus to the church in Philadelphia. I want to read it. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. This is interesting. He who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. I'm not going to read too much into that, but that's interesting, isn't it? If God shuts a door, no man's going to open it. But if God opens a door to a church, no man should shut it. I know your works, verse 8. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. God, God, try. I'm sorry. (laughs) For you have little strength. You have kept my word, and have not denied my name. In other words, you've not neglected your responsibility. Indeed, I will make those of the synagogue of Satan who say they are Jews and are not, but lie. Indeed, I will make them come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. That's a whole other topic for another time. But verse 10, notice, 
because you have kept my command to persevere, I also will keep you from the hour of trial, same word in the original, tribulation, which shall come upon the whole world. That's the seven year tribulation to test those who dwell on the earth. Behold, I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have, that no one may take your crown. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go out no more. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God. And I will write on him my new name. I can't wait. I, I, I never liked my name. I can't wait for my new name. I'm so curious to see what it's going to be. Anything but frog. Verse 13, he who has an ear, this is how every letter ends. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Number seven, lastly, certainly not least, (laughs) the best for last, really. The rapture has to happen before the seven year tribulation because of the encouragement from us and really for us and to us. First Thessalonians chapter four, verses 13 through 18. Brothers, We do not want you to be ignorant about those who fall asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We believe, by the way, for those of you who were with us for our study through 1 Thessalonians, this is the first letter that the Apostle Paul wrote early in his ministry. And right here you have the first mention from the Apostle Paul of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And isn't it interesting that it's in the context of the rapture of the church? That's the full gospel, if you will. He says, we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep, speaking of death in him. According to the Lord's own word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left till the coming of the Lord will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself, verse 16, will come down from heaven with a loud command, here it is, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up. Harpazo in the Greek, rapturous in the Latin, which which is where we get the word rapture. We will be raptured, caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. In the second coming, He comes to earth. In the rapture, we meet Him in the air. It's been said that at the rapture, He comes for us. At the second coming, He comes with us, ten thousands by His side. And so we will be with the Lord forever. And I want to draw your attention to verse 18. Therefore, encourage each other with these words. <laughs> okay, just again, bear with me. But how is it possible that Paul could say, therefore, encourage one another with these words, if you're going to go through the tribulation? You're probably going to be beheaded. Uh, a third of the population is going to die. It's going to be unspeakable horror as the wrath of God is poured out. And which, by the way, if you're a Christian, he already poured out his wrath on Christ. And so why is he pouring wrath out on you? Does that mean that what Jesus did is not finished? That's blasphemy. It just doesn't work. I mean, you cannot say, hey, you're going to go through unspeakable horror. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. That, that's cruel. That, 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 is, that is horrible. You, you can't say that. You can only say that if, hey, <laughs> you're not going to be here for that. Be encouraged. I'm not. Yeah. Oh, that's very encouraging. I know. 
And now encourage one another as you are already doing. Because it's all about the rapture. It's in the context of the rapture. Be encouraged. You're going to be taken out before all this comes down. Does that encourage you? I know it encourages me, especially with what's coming. Are you kidding me? Oh, I mean, I mean, with the the, the great reset, the financial collapse, it's just a matter of time when that happens. That's very terrifying, but I'm not terrified. I'm encouraged. Why? Because... I ain't going to be here. I know that's not proper English. Don't. (laughs) You know, what's really sad is a lot of Christians are just so fearful, unnecessarily scared, depressed, in despair. Unnecessarily. What are we going to do? What about? What if? No. It's irrelevant. It's immaterial. It's inconsequential. You're not going to be here. God's going to take you out of here. Be encouraged and encourage one another. Because we're going to be caught up to meet the Lord in the air before this all goes down. Thank you for your patience. For those of you online, if you're still watching, we're going to bring it in for a, a landing. <laughs> I'm sorry. I shouldn't use airport analogies as an Arab, but we're going to find a runway. We're going to bring it in for a landing here. As I mentioned at the beginning, I really sensed from the Lord that I was to do this teaching at this time because of how fast everything is moving. And it is my belief, and I believe this with all of my heart, and the Lord knows my heart, that the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ can happen at any time. And we are so close. I think it is sooner than any of us could possibly even begin to imagine. And I didn't want to wait. I was actually planning, as I mentioned last week, to do this probably later on, maybe September, October. And I just had this strong sense, no, you need to do it now. You need to do it now. Don't put it off. There's a lot of Christians that need to hear this. There's a lot of Christians that are just fearful, full of anxiety, and you need to settle this. And you need to teach the truth in love. I hope I've been gracious and loving. I know sometimes I can get snarky. It's a gift. (laughs) I don't mean to do that. I just am so passionate when it comes to the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture. You know, one last thing. Um, You know, the argument is made, and it's, there's merit to it. The rapture is not a salvation matter. Okay, that's fine. I'll give you that. But please consider this. If this is true, and it is, then wouldn't it stand to reason that it would have far-reaching ramifications for those who don't know Christ? In other words, you're, you're privy to information that can change somebody's life for all eternity. We're not just talking about life and death. We're talking about eternal life and eternal death. Right? Um, That to me would seem to be a salvation issue. Because if what you're saying is true, and it is, I just, I don't know what else I can do from Scripture to prove a pre-tribulation rapture, my goodness. So now, what about you? If you don't know the Lord, and this is true, what are you waiting for? That's salvation. You need to come to Christ now, today, or you're going to be left behind. You know, you've heard it said, hey, I'm, you know, I know I'll have a chance after the rapture, and if I'm left behind and this really happens, like you say, it's going to happen then I'll just 
I'll give my life to Christ in the tribulation. Really? What makes you so sure? If you're not willing to live for Christ prior to the tribulation, what makes you think you're going to die for Christ in the tribulation? Choose you this day whom you're going to serve. Today's the day of salvation. Seek Him while He may be found. Spirit of God isn't going to strive with man forever. You know, if you've been blowing Him off and shining Him on, and maybe you're watching online and the Lord's been speaking to you, trying to get your attention, there's going to come a time where you're not going to hear that knock on the door anymore. It's going to be too late. And I think that time is very soon. This is why we've been doing these prophecy updates for 14 years now, every week. And it's why we end with the gospel, the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, and a childlike explanation of salvation by way of the ABCs of salvation. The A, and this is not meant in any way to insult anyone's intelligence, it's just a childlike, simple explanation. Jesus said, unless you become like a child, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. What he was saying was, you know, children are so trusting, which is why we have to talk to them about stranger danger. What Jesus is saying is you need to have that childlike trust in me. The A is for admit or acknowledge that you're a sinner and that you need the Savior. Romans 3 verse 10 says, there is no one righteous, not even one. Romans 3.23 tells us why. It's because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We've all been born as sinners, which is why we must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Romans 6.23 is interesting because it pronounces, by way of the bad news, the death penalty, basically, for sin. That's the, the wage of sin is death. And you're guilty. And when you enter a plea, your plea is guilty as charged. Now, what's the sentence? Oh, it's the death sentence. That's the bad news. But here's the good news. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Like we just talked about in the bridal typology, the wedding typology with the groom and the bride. A gift is something that is given that you didn't pay for. If you pay for it, it's not a gift, it's a purchase. Somebody else purchased it. Jesus purchased it. He purchased you with His blood. And He paid the price, mohad, in full for you, for me. And He offers this gift that He paid for, the gift of eternal life. The B is for believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. Not you might, not you could, not you should. No, you will be saved. And then the C is for call upon the name of the Lord, or confess with your mouth, as Romans 10, 9 and 10 also says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. And here's why. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. And then lastly, Romans 10, 13. I love this. This was 38 years ago for me, on a January night. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's all? Yeah. All? Yeah. I'm an all, I know. All who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. If you're watching this online, and you've never called upon the name of the Lord, believing your heart, confessing with your mouth, acknowledging your sin, putting your trust in Him, I implore you, I plead with you. That is the most important decision of your life for eternal life. You need to make that decision today. Please stand, we'll pray. Father in heaven, thank you. First of all, thank you for the patience of these, your people. Lord, thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. 
Thank you for prophecy in the Bible. Thank you for the truth of the pre-tribulation rapture, because that changes everything. Lord, I pray for anyone who might be even here in this service today that has never called upon you. I pray that today they would make that decision. And for anyone watching online, it's not by accident that they're watching this video. I pray that today would be the, the day of their salvation. And then lastly, Lord, Maranatha, come quickly. In Jesus' name, amen.